everyone. I'm Carlos Fernandez Granda from the Grant Institute of Mathematical Sciences and the Center for Data Science at NYU, and today I'm going to talk about overfitting in linear regression. This is a lecture for the NYU AI School. The goal here is to understand overfitting in linear regression using basic concepts in linear algebra, such as subspaces and projections. Hopefully, this will illustrate how important it is to understand linear algebra well in order to analyze uh, machine learning and uh, statistics algorithms and models. Okay, so our aim here is going to be to estimate a certain quantity that we call the response y from p features that we call x1, x2 to xp. Okay, so the number of features is going to be p, which is some arbitrary number. Mathematically, what we want to do is we want to learn a function f such that when we get a new vector of features, p new features, we can estimate y out of from those p features. We'll see an example in a moment. We're going to be focusing on linear regression where we make the assumption that um, we want to learn a function that is linear. So it's just going to be a weighted sum, okay, and these weights are going to be fixed, of the features, and that's what's going to give us the prediction. Okay, a technical side note is that usually you would do some kind of preprocessing on these features where we center them uh, and we normalize them, but I'm not going to go into detail there. You can refer to, to any, um, you know, any textbook on, on linear regression for those details. They're not very important for the points I'm trying to make here. All right, so the idea is that we're going to estimate these coefficients beta, that these weights, which we use to, uh, which determine this function that we use to, to estimate the response, we're going to um, obtain those weights or coefficients from training data, from examples. So let's see what I'm talking about. We're going to focus on a particular example where we're trying to estimate the gross domestic product of Tennessee, okay, which essentially quantifies the economic activity in Tennessee. Um, and we want to estimate it just from the population and the unemployment rate. Okay, so again, we need this function that will tell us the GDP as a weighted sum of the population and the unemployment rate. Um, and how are we going to learn this function? We learn it from examples. So we look at the GDP for other states and also their populations and their unemployment rate. So again, in our notation, this is the, the population is the first feature, the unemployment rate is the second feature, and the response y is the GDP, which is what we want to estimate. And the idea is that we're going to use all of this data to learn some weights so that when we sum these two quantities weighted by those weights, we'll get a reasonable estimate of the GDP. Okay, that's what we're trying to do here. We can actually write this in... Um, in matrix form, uh, where we put these different examples, the response, so the response for the different examples in a, a vector, and now we have this um, linear estimate for each of the values of the response that only depends on those particular features. So what we do is we put the features for each corresponding examples as rows of a matrix, now, the linear model is just given by the inner product between this row and the coefficients because remember that the coefficients are the same, okay? This is the whole point. We're trying to determine coefficients that work for all these possible states. Okay, since the coefficients are fixed, um, if you remember your, your linear algebra, the first entry of this vector is given by the first row times this other vector. The second, I'll do this in another color. The second entry is given by the second row, which are the features corresponding to the second example, times the same coefficients, and so on and so forth. So essentially, when we're fitting the linear model, what we're saying is we want this, so this matrix we're going to call X, okay? We want this um, matrix vector multiplication to give us a good approximation to the training data to the training responses that we're observing. That's what we want. So how do we quantify by a good approximation? Well, the, by far the most popular choice is to just look at the, 
uh, at the error that you're making for each of the examples, take its square and sum over the number of examples. Okay, in, in more linear algebraic notation, this is the square of the L2 norm of the error vector. But really what we're doing is we're quantifying the energy of the error by summing the square of the individual errors. The estimate that we achieve by minimizing this, um, least, this um, sum of squares error is called the ordinary least squares estimate in, in statistics. Okay, this is um, if you fix beta so that the sum of squares of the error, so here I've missed the square there, it doesn't really matter whether you put the square or not, you're going to get the same coefficients. That's called the ordinary least squares estimate or the minimum uh, least squares estimate. And that's what we're going to be focusing on today. So this is a very simple drawing of the least squares estimate or the um, OLS estimate if you want to use um, this notation that uh, people in statistics really like, OLS. Um, here we only have one feature and we're trying to estimate Y and this shows you that essentially uh, we're here we're only learning one coefficient which is the slope of this curve, of this, uh, sorry, the slope of this line and this is the estimate, okay? For each value of the feature, for example 0 0.8, this would be our estimate of y for 0 0.8. Once you have the coefficient, you can estimate y for any possible value of the feature. Of course, in our case of interest, you only you not only you don't only have one feature; you have um, many features. Okay, so this is more difficult to show on a graph. Okay, so let's go back to our example. The coefficients for the population and for GDP once you uh, solve this least squares problem are equal to 1 and to minus 0 0.1 here I have to um, again point out that when we do this fit we're actually normalizing and centering the data again that's not super important for what I'm um, for the concept that we're discussing here but this is just so you know uh, so that these two coefficients are actually comparable so it turns out that the GDP is roughly proportional to the population and it's actually, you know, most of the estimate is, is given by the population when you do this weighted average. But unemployment also has a significant effect, which is a negative effect. So the more unemployment, uh, the less GDP a state seems to have. Okay, so if we uh, look at the um, response estimates for our training data, which are this, and also our test data, which is Tennessee, we get that we get, we have a pretty reasonable fit, especially taking into account that we only have two uh, features. Okay, and the estimate for the uh, the estimate for the GDP of Tennessee is actually of Tennessee is actually not that far. Okay, so here we have a reasonable estimate. Okay, so now we're going to use linear algebra to try to understand some properties of this least squares estimate okay, of, uh, in linear regression. So we go back to this linear algebra perspective where our model can be written as uh, the product of a certain matrix that has all the features and these fixed coefficients. Okay, because again, the first estimate of the response in the training set is going to be given by the first row times this vector of coefficients, the second value of the response is going to be given by the second row times the same coefficients, and so on and so forth. So now it turns out that we can express this matrix vector multiplication as a sum of the columns of this matrix. So it's probably better if you just check this on your own on a piece of paper, but it turns out that if you perform this matrix vector multiplication, what you end up with is you're just like if you actually you can see it in the following way. You this first coefficient is multiplying that's one. It's also then like when you when you you know when you compute the first value of the response, this first co co um, this first coefficient is multiplying x one. When you compute the second value of the response, this coefficient is multiplying x2 of 1, and so on and so forth. So basically, it's just multiplying the first column. Okay. The same happens 
when you look at the second coefficient, this second coefficient is just multiplying the second column when you perform the matrix vector multiplication. So that is why you can actually express this matrix vector multiplication as just weighting the first coefficient, weighting the first column by the first coefficient, the second column by the second coefficient, the pth column by the pth coefficient. To simplify notation here, I'm calling the first column of the matrix S1, the second of the column of the matrix X2, um, up to XP. So this basically means that when we're fitting a linear model, we're basically expressing the responses in our training set as linear combinations of the features. Okay, that's it, of vectors that contain each of the P features. These linear combinations, if uh, like to use a linear algebraic concept, um, form a subspace. Or geometrically, they form um, a, a plane or a hyperplane. So imagine that you have just two features, x1 and x2. Okay, I have drawn these features in a three-dimensional space here. Okay, like this would be an example where you would have three examples two features and three examples. So now in that case, here each of these vectors would have three entries. Okay, this is why our ambient space is three dimensional. And we would have just two columns. Okay, this is the example that I've drawn here. And what I'm trying to show here is that every possible value, um, every possible value of the response given by a fixed, um, value of the coefficients is on this uh, pink plane. That's what you're constrained to because of your value of your features. Okay, those are the possible values that you're going to obtain when you're approximating the response on the training set. The response in general is not going to be given exactly by the linear, a linear combination of the two feature vectors. Okay, it's going to be out of this plane. You cannot express it exactly as a linear combination of the two feature vectors. And what we've just said is that we're going to pick the linear combination that is closest to the response. So the point in this plane, okay, that is closest to this green point. Um, if you remember your linear algebra, you will now realize that that's exactly the projection of the response onto the plane uh, and this plane again is the plane of all possible linear combinations of the feature vectors. So this means that we can interpret this least squares estimate as a projection of the re training response vector onto the training feature vector. And that is going to be quite useful to explain overfitting linear regression as we'll see in a moment. But for a moment, imagine that the linear model is true, okay? There is a true vector of coefficients such that the response is given by a linear combination of the features, okay? And that linear combination is weighted using this true coefficient vector. And then also imagine that the test data follows the same model and um, basically the response in the test data you, that you observe is equal to a linear combination of the test features and, um, and the coefficients are given by exactly the same um, coefficients as in training. If that were the case, under the assumption that X is actually full rank and you have more examples than the number of features, but that is a, you know, you, you need obviously need more data than the number of features. In that case, your prediction would be perfect. You would be able to find the vector of coefficients and you would get a perfect estimate of your test data. But of course, this is never going to be the case. You're never going to observe data that follows a particular model, no matter what model that might be, because you're always going to have inaccuracies in your data or part of the response that can actually not be explained with the features that you have. Okay, as George Fox said, all models are wrong, but some are useful. And linear regression models are often extremely useful, but they're obviously not going to hold exactly. 
here we're going to model this situation by uh, expressing the response as a linear combination of the features plus some noise that just captures the nonlinear stuff that we cannot that uh, we cannot express as a linear combination or also just some random noise that is not related to the features okay and now we're going to ask ourselves what does the training error look like under this model because that will give us some important insights into when overfitting happens for linear regression okay so again remember we have um, shown that when we're doing linear regression essentially what is happening with the training set is that we're um, projecting this um, training response onto the um, onto the feature vectors that we have in our training set okay so this is what i'm expressing here that our, our estimate is just the projection of the response and this projection is happening onto this plane of a uh, span by the feature vectors of linear combinations of the feature vectors so now under the assumption that we have this um, like this this model holds for our data where there are these two coefficients but we have this extra uh, component that cannot be explained linearly what happens then is that our estimate is equal to the projection of um, the linear part that can be explained plus the projection of um, of this additional component so here I'm applying the fact that the projection of a vector onto a plane is um, if that sorry the projection of the sum of two vectors onto a plane is equal to the sum of their projections this you can prove easily uh, I'm not going to do it because it's we don't have time for that but you can look up any linear algebra book and, and you'll see a proof so the point is that now we have two terms in our estimate one comes from this linear part that is what we're, we're hoping to to be able to learn and the other one comes from this interference part which is the part that we cannot hope to explain linearly so now i want you to think for a moment and if necessary pause the video what is this projection equal to okay so if we go back to our picture and um, the projection means that we take a vector that is no matter where and we put it onto this plane the thing is that by definition, this guy is a linear combination of the columns of X, right? We have shown that when we have a multiplication of a matrix X times some coefficients, essentially what we're doing is a linear combination of the columns. So this guy is actually already inside. It's in somewhere inside this plane. So when we project, what happens? Think about it for a moment. Well, what happens is nothing. Essentially, we obtain the same point because it's already inside the plane. That's obviously the point in the plane that is closest. So here, this sum is just equal to the linear part itself plus the projection of the part that we cannot explain. So if we look at our error, our training error, which is the response minus the estimate, it's going to be the truth. Okay, this is the response according to this model that we're applying to, to analyze this, minus this guy, which is the estimate. So this is going to cancel out the linear part we're not going to make an error on the linear part that part we're going to estimate very well we're left with um, this additional component minus its projection onto the plane and this is going to allow us again to analyze uh, what the training error is going to be equal to under some quite mild assumptions so let's assume that this component that is not linearly explainable has a total energy equal to sigma squared. This is just some arbitrary notation. People like to use sigma squared for noise in statistics and signal processing, and that's what I'm used to, okay? But that's basically just how large this component that we cannot explain is. And we're gonna think that it's equally spread in all n dimensions. This essentially expresses that it's not related to the linear part. It's completely unrelated to the features, okay? it's spread in all n dimensions so how much energy um, is going to be captured by this subspace this plane this hyperplane of p dimensions okay think about it for a moment 
well just p over n right because that's the fraction of the space that is inside that hyperplane okay so the projection of c so again this where I'm, what am i getting at if i think about if c has a total energy of uh, sigma squared how much energy is in this projection well i'm projecting i'm in an ambient space of dimension n because that's the number of examples okay so the total energy is sigma squared i mean a total dimension like the total number of dimensions is n and i'm projecting onto a plane that has dimension p so i the energy that is going to be preserved is going to be p over n times the total energy so now we have that our training error is going to be sigma squared minus sigma squared and p over okay this is exactly what i wrote there so this means that the energy of our error is sigma squared times one minus p over so this was you know a bit of a hand wavy uh, computation uh, because i don't want to go into the details but you can make this precise quite easily by for example saying that this component um, is an uh, iid gaussian vector for example but you know like the the intuition is what's important here if this component that cannot be explained is equally spread out in all dimensions then it's going to be it's going to have an energy that is going to scale with uh, p over n so now we're going to notice two things the first thing we notice is that when the number of data is roughly equal to the number of features so n is equal to p the training error is very small in fact it cancels out exactly when p is equal to n so now i want you to think is this a good thing is this good news for a model like if you if you you know if you realize that you have a number of data that is more or less equal to the number of features and you perform this computation and realize that the training error is going to be extremely small are you happy with this again maybe pause the video and think for this think about this for a moment well you're no you're not going to be happy you're going to be quite upset because again by definition we cannot explain c we shouldn't be able to explain c with our, with, our, with our model and if our error is less than sigma squared then we are explaining z we're overfitting the part that we cannot explain so that's obviously not going to generalize to our test data so this is very bad news when the number of data is significantly larger than the number of features so n is much larger than p then the training error is actually sigma squared, which is the, the total energy in C, which means that we're not fitting C, which is a very good thing. Okay, so then we won't get overfit. This is essentially the key observation that we arrive at. And the way we have been able to arrive at it is by understanding that the training error is basically the difference between uh, the feature, the response vector, and a projection onto a p-dimensional subspace. So thanks to linear algebra. Uh, to drive the point home, um, let's consider a case where the number of data is exactly equal to the number of features. In that case, x is completely square. So if the, if the feature matrix is invertible, we can solve the equation x beta equals to the training response exactly. Okay, so we're going to get these coefficients that we're going to obtain by applying the inverse of x to the feature, uh, sorry, to the response vector. So the training error is going to be exactly zero, just as we had predicted here with our projection argument. Okay. So why is this bad news? We have training error is equal to zero. Well, when we look at the difference between the true coefficients and the estimated coefficients, because again, we're making this assumption that our response is given by a linear model but plus some additional component that cannot be explained linearly what we see is that when we apply the inverse we actually cancel out x in beta here in uh, our um, um, in the linear part so that's great because that means that we ob we obtain the true vector coefficients but we have an extra term here where we have the inverse applied to um, this additional component and that can be very very large okay it can be very large so the fact that we have low training error does not mean that we're estimating the coefficients well 
this is just a very simple example where the number of features uh, sorry the number of data is equal to the number of features and you have get overfitting uh, direct our projection argument is a generalization of this to when uh, the number of um, data is not exactly equal to the number of features and it predicts that we're going to be fine as long as the number of data is large with respect to the number of features okay so now you know i've been telling you this story based on linear algebra and projections and so on and why why would you believe that is actually useful in practice so let's take a look uh, at um, at an example with real world data this is a data set of hourly temperatures measured at weather stations all over the u.s which is available online and i've chosen to predict the temperature in yosemite because i used to live in california from other temperatures in the um, in stations all over the u.s so our response that we want to estimate is going to be the temperature in Yosemite and we want to estimate it as a linear combination of features which is the temperatures at that moment in 133 other stations all over the US. Our training data is going to be based on 2015. We're going to have a test set that is also taken out of 2015 and another test set that is taken out of 2016. Okay, and now I'm going to show you the results when you have different numbers of training data. So here, and now let me tell you first what the, these different colors mean. The blue dots are the training error for different values of training data, of number of training data. Um, the purple values are the, uh, is the test error, which is what we really care about. I have a different test set, which is um, data from 2016 just so that you see that this actually generalizes to some extent across different years and um, this uh, this line up here is just the error that you get if you just use a single station maybe the closest station to yosemite or whatever actually you don't get a, a very good estimate uh, you get around oops, sorry you get around six degrees of error okay so let's see what happens for different numbers of um, training data when the training data is equal to the number of features then the training error is zero just as we predicted and also as we predicted but like more intuitively the, over there the test error is pretty large so it's actually worse than just using a single station it's a pretty terrible estimate we are completely overfitting however as the number of training data increases we see that on the one hand um, the training error becomes larger as we had predicted until it saturates at a certain value and the test error becomes better and better okay so i'm saying over and over as we had predicted let's see how good our prediction was so if you remember our prediction was that the training error was going to scale like one minus p over n here i'm plotting the square root because i want to um express the error in degrees celsius as opposed to squares of degrees celsius which wouldn't make a lot of sense at least intuitively so we'll have to take a square root here and what we see is that the training error scales exactly like the square root of one minus p over n which is the formula that we have derived exclusively from this um this assumption that the underlying model has a linear component and a nonlinear component, and that the nonlinear component is kind of uh, incoherent in the sense that it's not aligned with this hyperplane of feature vectors in the training data. Just with that simple geometric assumption, we have derived a formula that predicts the training error for this real data uh, almost exactly. So just so that you see that um, this linear algebra argument is actually very powerful. Um, in any case, the bottom line here is that, as predicted, uh, in linear regression, you're going to get severe overfitting when you don't have enough data. But when you have enough data, the model is actually pretty good. So just to recap, uh, fitting a linear regression model to some training data can be interpreted in terms of a projection onto a subspace. This yields a precise description of the training error as a function of the number of data. And it shows that overfitting can be an issue and is an issue even for linear models. The take home message is that linear algebra is a key tool 
uh, in the design and analysis of uh, machine learning methodology. And I hope I have motivated you to learn some more linear algebra. Thank you very much for your attention.